Welcome back to the panel discussion, Government Perspectives on Mobility in the Cloud, sponsored by Microsoft on Federal News Radio 1500 AM and federalnewsradio.com. Our guests today are Sylvia Burns, the Chief Information Officer at the Department of Interior, and Susie Adams, the Chief Technology Officer for Microsoft Federal. I'm your host, Jason Miller. So before break, we just started to get into the, the security conversation. I, I teased people a little bit, so let's jump right in both feet. When you talk about mobility, when you talk about cloud, everyone... Security is the first thing people get to. I made the joke earlier about it took us only five minutes to mention it. Let me turn to Sylvia first to start the discussion. When you look at cloud, when you look at mobility, does one have more security concerns than the other, or are they interrelated? G give me a sense of where you are. Yeah, they're totally interrelated. I mean, if you just think about how we use our Google Suite now, which includes our email as well as collaboration tools, I mean, that's a cloud application that's being served up to us, and we're mobile because we're just taking that wherever on whatever device. Um, to do our work, so they're hugely integrated, and I think that when you make the decision to move forward with something like that, um, basically, it, it kind of just doesn't all happen magically. You sit down first with a lot of smart people and, and look at what risk exposure, um, whatever you're talking about buying, um, exposes you to, and then you got to figure out, you know, can I mitigate the risk, can I accept, that kind of thing, so um, basically there's a process that gets you there. A lot of times when you talk about mobility, you think of mobile device management, MDMs. And when you think of cloud, you think of FedRAMP. Um, are, are, there's some, been some discussion about is there a FedRAMP for mobile, mobile apps needed, which is you know, very similar to what I think DHS is doing with the car wash. Uh, let me turn to Susie for a second and ask about the, how those two fit together and from what you're seeing from your customers. FedRAMP in mobile device management. Just the idea of security and the integration between mobile and, and cloud, and, and, and is it is one a bigger stumbling block than the other for for your customers? No, I, I think I, I agree with with Sylvia. It's a, they literally go hand in hand. Um, you can't if you're going to have a mobile device and it's going to have data that you can it, that's actionable data that you can do something with. You're going to be concerned about the security of that data on that device. And what happens if you lose that device? Right, you leave it in a cab, which happens frequently when people travel. How do you notify your IT department so they can wipe it? Right, what happens? Do you want to pin protect that so that if somebody tries to get in three times, it just wipes the device uh, automatically? Uh, do I, do I uh, encrypt the data on the device and make sure that all, all the important data is actually encrypted? Do I encrypt my email? going back and forth from that device. And usually all that all that data coming to your device is usually coming from a cloud, uh, especially if you're talking email and collaboration and those types of documents. So I think they absolutely go hand in hand. So a couple of things you mentioned there that, that piqued my interest. You talked about the device a couple of times. You talked about the data a couple of times. And there's always that argument, what do you protect? Do you protect the device or do you protect the data? Where do you stand? Uh, both. I don't, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's both. Uh, and I think the devices are the, the device capabilities are what enable you to do some of these things. There's got to be firmware, and the device has to support the ability to do things like manage certificates, right? To do to handle TPM chips, so that you can do you know virtual things like virtual smart cards and two-factor authentication. Uh, those things weren't in the older mobile devices, and now they they are in all the newer devices, regardless of what device you're using. And I think without that, I think you, you wouldn't be able to do what we could do today. Yeah. I, mean, so that, I think that's so. So it's like um, the the protection you put around a device is really kind of the means the end because ultimately it really is about the data and the information that you have um, that needs to be protected. Um, in the federal government, we we talk a lot about the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of inf the information, and looking at those dimensions when we're talking about risk. So. One thing about protecting the device, you mentioned smart card, two-factor authentication. There's a, obviously a big push from NIST around derived credentials in terms of how it affects you know, FIPS 201-1, HSPD-12, all the acronyms. Is that something that agencies are asking for yet, Susie, or is it still that's a little far out? Because with all this push to mobile, I mean, you know, beyond DOD maybe, a lot of the civilian agencies don't seem to recognize they need that two-factor. Uh, no, dis they disagree. actually. No, I think they actually are asking for it. I think the challenge is how do you in how do you actually implement that today, given the constraints that many of the agencies are under, and then you start to apply other regulations like trusted internet connection, which really is very difficult for agencies to implement given the current guidelines with a commercial cloud. Uh, your hands are really tied. I mean, in some instances, it's really just extending your data center versus allowing you to take any device and access that cloud outside the agency's network. And so, I think there's a lot of work uh, currently 
currently underway right now with DHS uh, and with the FedRAMP pr uh, Program Management Office and with all the major cloud vendors trying to work through some of these issues to figure out, you know, how do we go into this next generation of computing and update those policies and procedures that have been in place for the traditional computing environment so that federal agencies can actually take advantage of all the new technology that's out there that their commercial counterparts have been able to do for several years. You great segue. Thank you very much. You make my job very easy. You talk <laughs> about some of the policies like TIC that maybe needs to be relooked at. Even HSP twelve. I understand there's some people starting to relook at that as well. But what are there? Are there other roadblocks to the integration of mobile and cloud? Whether it's acquisition or policies. Uh, Sylvia, from your perspective, what stands in your way from just going full force into both areas? Well, Anything? I, <laughs> I mean, procurement is always hard in the federal government. We're highly regulated, um, and you know, people talk about the life cycle of technology is relatively short, and the procurement life cycle can be way longer than the, the actual technology life cycle. So, um, you know, looking at what can be done to kind of kind of bring things more into sync. Um, I know OMB recently released something called TechFAR. Um, Correct. That's, that's the idea behind the digital services where they're just pulling the stuff out of the, the, the federal acquisition regulation that says, here's the, the tools you can use that already exist. Uh, it would be interesting to see that the pickup, it's still very early, so we won't obviously be too critical of them yet. But we will be eventually, maybe. But <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me ask you, Sylvia, when it comes to procurement, though, are you starting to work with your acquisition folks to say, how can we, if you will, pay by the drink, how can we buy cloud and buy mobility differently? If you have the big contract. Is that part of that contract? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So our relationship with our acquisition team is, you know, one of the most important relationships that we have. And I would say one of the things in acquisitions is I think it's building acquisition specialists who really know IT because it really is a, a kind of a, a unique um, specialty area. And if you know more, I think that it's easier to get through, you know, uh, the whole process. Um, so I think that relationship is hugely important. And um, for us, uh, you know, the contracts that we've awarded, um, clearly that's what takes us in the direction we want to go in. Now, Susie, this would be a loaded question for Sylvia, so I'll throw it to you instead. The funding model that agencies are under is tough. Is there something Microsoft does with their customers to, to if you will, work differently? Because it is the pay by the drink model that everyone talks about. L l the elasticity. There is, most agencies really can't do that. Correct. Uh, by law, which is kind of an interesting challenge. And so um, we do have, we are very creative in how we partner with our with agencies around this um, to help them do things like true up or true down based on how many how many people have actually used, for example, an email service. Um, as we get into things like infrastructure as a service, it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, but then we are kind of working through very similar, if you look at the, the uh, cell phone industry, a very similar challenge for them as people wanted to be able to, they kind of liked to be able to pay for only what they use until they realized that their son or daughter used, you know, a bazillion <laughs> minutes one day, and now they're being charged. And so, you know, those types of things, we are being very creative uh, with how we work with our customers. We're also being creative in, in, in how, from a licensing perspective, I mean, we used to, you know, there used to never be subscription-based software. And they, maybe not even the cloud, but just the desktop software. And so if you look at kind of what we're doing with Office now, you know, even with Office 365, we're packaging software with that subscription. So that as people, as the user, and especially for Department of Interior, you have a very uh, uh, changing, wor or uh, your workforce goes dynamic up and down. Works, dynamic right? is probably the right I word. I love your model, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> like that. Because it goes up and down because they have all the seasonal workers that they do. And so we are trying to be, you know, as creative as we can, uh, not only with federal agencies, but with all our uh, enterprise customers as well. So we know acquisition is tough. We know the funding model coming from Congress is, you know, something we could spend a lot of time on. Susie, do you see other challenges that maybe that, that could be overcome, that, that maybe some agencies are doing a better job of overcoming? We won't ask you to name names per se, unless we want to. But what else can, what else can be done out there that, to make cloud adoption, mobile adoption easier? Well, what I'm seeing is kind of a, a more of a focus on the applications themselves and not just necessarily trying to boil the ocean. And so we're starting to see, and some of this comes from kind of the agile development push that's out there, instead of creating a large contract for an application that gets delivered in you know, 16, 18, 24 months, it's a small t team of people, a small acquisition for you know five to 10 developers to quickly develop something, a, a quick app that can be deployed on a variety of different devices that really has a, you know, a a pretty big bang for the buck. And so we're starting to see those types of short wins uh, help agencies learn how to work in this new world. 
and also take advantage of, you know, how do, or, and work through things like how do I secure that data that's in that mobile app? How do I take the data that a citizen gives me in a citizen facing app and actually make that actionable so I can do something with it? How do I help the information worker that's looking at that data, uh, mash that data up from a business intelligence perspective, real time on a, you know, on the device of their choice, because that matters now, because the citizens are now talking to you real time. You're not putting them in a queue and responding in three months, you know, kind of thing. And so we're starting to see those things really take off um, and do so quickly. So it's not six month acquisition cycles. It's the RFP comes out and three weeks later it's due or two weeks sometimes and sometimes it's less than that. So we are seeing a huge push. So if you're through your cloud contract, is that something you're also trying to uh, uh, ask, beg, mandate <laughs> your, 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 your other uh, bureaus to do in terms of the quick agile development? Well, so I would tell you that um, we're learning a lot fast. Um, when we jumped into this, we probably didn't know a whole bunch of stuff that we know now that we should have known, right? Um, but we're getting better every day. And I would say that um, the thing that that's really emerging is sort of the architectural piece that was that, you know, we, we jumped into cloud and doing our solicitation and we made an award of our contract. Um, I would tell you that without much thinking about the, the architectural implications behind the scenes of what, what ultimately were we gonna build with this. And I think it goes back to what Susie was saying about you're really looking at your, um, your high, moderate, and low you know, environments based on the risk around the information that you've got, you know, and you're trying to put out there. Um, so I think that had, I think where we're going next is taking that knowledge that we've gained um, through all that we've been through with the contract that we've got and um, thinking now about the architectural implications and trying to maybe um, kind of like uh, kind of weave ourselves back to where we're actually going to build an architecture that actually makes sense for us. So, All right. yeah. Another great segue to, to kind of wrap this conversation up a little bit. We've talked a lot about cloud, mobile, the integration, where it is, where, 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 where it was. Where are we heading with this? Because, you know, the future is mobility. We know that. Let's just get that out of the way. We know the future is cloud. Agencies will move to the cloud, whether it's like what Sylvia was saying with six core data centers. You can call that a data center. But really what you're going to pre present is a government cloud. Susie, I know from your experience that, that Microsoft is getting, you know, a lot of interest in, in the, the Azure and all the cloud pieces that you have. Where is this heading over the next, you know, three, five, seven years? Let me start with Susie. I think, you know, first and foremost, I think you're going to see it be less about, from a mobility perspective, the actual device. The devices are going to be a dime a dozen. They're going to come out, and they do today. Right? There's a new flavor every week from one, you know, one vendor. New vendors will pop up. I think you're going to see that it's going to be more about the experiences and the end user experiences that are delivered on those devices. And I think you're going to see that you're going to the software uh, developers of the world and the, the folks that can uh, really write code and do the software automation and, and deliver that uh, very quickly and easily keep it up to date is going to be more important than it's ever been before. Uh, because an out-of-date date device, if I'm using it here to navigate uh, to the studio, if that if that map is out of date or I haven't been delivered the great, latest and greatest app or for some reason, I'm not going to get to where I'm going, and then the user experience is going to fail. And the you know the individual usually attributes that to the device, which is kind of an interesting challenge. So I think uh, that's the first play, the first thing I think we're going to see, uh, and then I think we're going to see people really embrace the cloud. Uh, and I think you're going to see privacy, uh, security, and trust, not just security. Uh, as well as transparency about where your data lives uh, and data location and data access matter. And I think that that was something that early on, uh, with the promise of cloud in the purest of terms, everybody thought that wouldn't matter. And I think everybody's come to the realization, both the vendors and the consumers, that, wow, we, we really need to think about this internationally, right? We're going to need treaties in place, very similar to what we did with telcos. I think all that is going to start to happen. It's probably going to be a very long road. Um, to get to where we need to be there. And so I think you're going to start seeing um, a lot of innovative solutions from vendors where we can help people do exactly what the federal government is trying to do, which is develop these, I call them communities of interest clouds uh, that mirror and mimic exactly what you get in a commercial enterprise system. Just real quick, Susie, are you getting a lot of clients, uh, federal agencies asking you, where where does where will my data live? Are they worried absolutely. about that? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Especially in the federal space. But we see that in state and local, and we see it worldwide. They want to know, where's my private primary and secondary data center, what data, if any, is used by the organization for uh, whether it's data mining uh, uh, or uh, marketing and advertising, they absolutely want to know that. Right. Sylvia, you get the last word of the day. T give us a sense, where do you see Interior going, cloud, mobile integration? 
uh, so I think this trend is just going to continue, and I think where where it's all really going is us driving shared services. So if I th if I talk to you about our email solution, when we started, um, gee, ten years ago, there were fourteen separate email solutions. Now there's one. Um, and my organization offers it as a shared service for everybody in the Department of the Interior. So I think that um, that that's the trend that I'm talking about that will continue is services being more and more offered as um, as a service, you know, as as a shared service where we're building once use many. Um, so I think that model is going to continue just because it makes good business sense. And, and the cloud enables that really, Absolutely. because you can you can have it live somewhere and everyone can access it, whether it's through their desktop, their their thin client, or wherever. What's the next for you guys on shared services? Where are you heading next? Well, we're we're trying to pursue um, putting in place shared services for all the commodity IT in the department. Um, so we're we're working on building our basic framework, talking about governance around that. Um, talking about what specific services are we going to put up next in terms of um, you know offering them as enterprise services, really in collaboration with our bureaus and offices because we want to leverage the expertise that we have through the whole agency. And I know that's a big challenge at Interior, not just the, the collaboration, the governance is key. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. You've been listening to the panel discussion, Government Perspectives on Mobility in the Cloud, sponsored by Microsoft, on Federal News Radio 1500 AM and federalnewsradio.com. Our guests today were Sylvia Burns, the Chief Information Officer of the Department of Interior, and Susie Adams, the Chief Technology Officer for Microsoft Federal. I'm your host, Jason Miller. If you miss any part of this panel or if you want more information, please visit federalnewsradio.com slash one cloud. On behalf of Microsoft, thank you for joining us for this informative discussion. You'll be presented with some polling questions as you leave the webinar to help us improve future sessions. We appreciate your feedback. We'll have the archive from this session available shortly and a link will be sent to you for you to share with your colleagues. Those of you who requested a training certificate for this webinar should receive it in the next two weeks. Be sure to register for upcoming webinars from the Capital Exchange. Look for upcoming sessions at fedinsider.com. This concludes today's webinar. I would like to thank you for attending.